Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Oh. About 18,000 until 10,000 B. Hey guys, original link, all the things. My name's Connor, if you're new, hello. Let's learn about this, or you can teach me things. Ancient sites of France. The cave, right, with the... Uh, all the bo the bowl Neolithic site. What is it called? I forget, but it's really old. Let's learn. You see, long before stone. Well, how old? From about 18,000 until 10,000 BC, long mm. before Stonehenge and the pyramids, back when mammoths and saber-toothed cats still roamed the earth, prehistoric people painted deep inside caves in this part of Europe. These weren't just crude doodles, but huge and sophisticated projects executed by artists and supported by an impressive culture, the Magdalenians. They look like giant nostrils. So. The region's limestone cliffs, honeycombed with painted caves, are unique on this planet. Tourists gather nearby at Lescaux, home of the region's and the world's most famous cave paintings. These caves were discovered accidentally in 1940 by four kids and their dog. Over the next couple decades, about a million visitors climbed through the prehistoric wonderland, inadvertently tracking in fungus on their shoes and changing the humidity and the temperature with their breathing. In just 15 years, the precious art deteriorated more than in the 15,000 years before that. The caves were closed to the public. Damn it. Visitors can now experience the wonder of Lesko by touring an adjacent replica. So it's near. When their time comes, the visitors are called to meet their guide for a look at the precisely copied cave called Lesko 2. Any, has anyone we been are here? In the Oxen Room, the most spectacular room of Lesko, it's a sacred place. We don't live in a church, they never lived in a caves. And it's a huge composition, it's a calculated composition because they have taken uh, advantage of a strip of rock to relate in a cell. I love this guy's voice. Yes. Uh, I'm curious how clear it was prior, or like when the first people stumbled upon it. Um, Like, okay, all right. We have taken uh, advantage of a strip of rock to relate in a circle to... Oh, wait, group. this is the replica. I'm an idiot. Oh. ...advantage of a strip of rock to relate in a circle to groups of bulls facing each other. And in the center of this composition, they have united the three principal animals of Lesko, horse, ox, and deer. Is this a hunting scene? No, it's not a hunting uh, scene because on the walls, the hunter doesn't exist. They never tell the everyday life. The meaning is more complex. What is the biggest animal? Is this uh, bull. Is the largest painting in the cave art, 16 feet from the top of the horn to the tip of the tail. It's quite good. Uh, way better than I could draw. Must have had some practice. I'm terrible at drawing. Same with my handwriting. But it's like good proportions. I feel like whenever I try to draw an animal on four legs, I make like the body way too big or something. Is that a hump? 16 feet from the top of the horn to the tip of the tail. The guide explains that this 600 animal multi-cave composition was the work of a complex society, the Magdalenians. Their culture allowed for skilled artists to work over an extended period of time in this sacred place. They fix maybe on the walls a dream, a myth, a knowledge, and the image will be able to approach generations. The image becomes the memory of the society. The art of Lesco is supposed to be around 17,000 years old. But compared to the beginning of the humanity, which was born in Africa three million years ago, Lesco, it was yesterday. They were like us. Question. When we say humanity was three million years ago, are they saying that 
because it's not like you know three million years ago, like three million and and one years ago, they were so much different than three million years ago. So that that's just a a general area of. And here's my question. I've asked this in different videos, but I, I can't stop. I, I think it's fascinating to think about how far back, let's say I travel back in time or anyone did. And, and I wore, like, there was no other clue. There were no clues of the time I came from. I just, I go back in time and they look at me or anyone and they're just like, something is off about you. Like you, how far back in time would we have to go? for us to be genetically different enough to where even if you had age appropriate stuff on for the era, you would still look weird. Like someone would notice and be like, you look a little strange, more strange than the general variation of people that look different at the time. But do you know what I mean? Cause there had to have been a time far back enough to where even if you wore everything correctly, and talked correctly, you would still look strange to them. Anyone? You know what I'm trying to ask? I pressed stop recording instead of play by accident. My bad. It was yesterday. They were like us. The region has many more examples. And young of the humanity, which was born in Africa three million years ago, let's go, it was yesterday, they were like us. The region has many more examples of prehistoric cave painting, and the nearby National Museum of Prehistory provides an instructive background. This modern museum houses over 18,000 bones, Who's stones, standing? and fascinating little... Is it built on top of an archaeological site? And that's why... ...houses over 18,000 bones, stones, and fascinating little doodads, all uncovered locally. Doodads. Artifacts are originals, and show that while the Magdalenian Freaking people... Stop talking. Me, me. Artifacts are Not originals him. and show that while the Magdalenian people lived 15,000 years ago, they were far more advanced than your textbook cavemen. Skeletons were discovered draped in delicate jewelry. Stag teeth and tiny shells were, it seems, lovingly drilled to be strung into necklaces. These barbed spearheads and fish hooks would work well today. Finely carved spear throwers show impressive realism for something three times as old as the oldest pyramids. Jeez. Imagine Jeez. flickering flames from these oil lamps lighting those art covered caverns. Today, as we ponder like the prehistoric fat caves oil? and the artifacts of the Magdalenian people here. I'm assuming like animal fat lamps? Today, as we ponder the prehistoric caves and the artifacts of the Magdalenian people here in the Dordogne, we can marvel at how much we actually have in common with these people and how sophisticated their culture was so long ago. While well, its cities are packed with important sites, Provencal life feels rooted in its countryside, small towns and vibrant markets. Its famous fields of lavender and sunflowers inspire... Sorry, I'm sitting on a medicine ball. So I just, I had to move it. While its cities are packed with important sites, Provencal life feels rooted in its countryside, small towns, and vibrant markets. Its famous fields of lavender and sunflowers inspire painters. Its howling mistral wind can, as they say, blow the ears off a donkey. And its coveted Cote de Rhone wines showcase this region's confident mastery of good living. And around here, good living is never far from nature. Where else can you canoe through such charming scenery and then under a nearly 2,000-year-old aqueduct? This Roman? region's evocative Roman ruins make history part of the picnic. The Pont du Gard reminds us that throughout the ancient world, aqueducts were stone flags heralding the greatness of Rome. They still proclaim the wonders of that age. This perfectly preserved Roman bridge supported a canal or aqueduct on the very top. It was a critical link, helping keep a steady river of water flowing cross country to Nîmes, one of the Roman Empire's largest cities. Remarkably, the water dropped only one inch for every 350 feet. Let's go inside. 
Well, if you have to go a long distance, then it's it's going to have to be super. I'm, I'm assuming you'd want it as gradual and a decline as possible. Well, for the water to keep flowing, but so that you could travel as far as possible. Unless you got to a certain certain distance and then use like an Archimedes screw or something to lift it back up and then repeat. This is what Roman aqueducts were all about. This is part of a 30 mile long channel. A man-made river flowed through this for 400 years. You can still see the original stones, a thin layer of mortar that waterproofed the channel, and after centuries of use, a thick mineral buildup. The Pont du Gard's main arch is the largest the Romans ever built, 80 feet across. The bridge itself has no mortar, just ingeniously stacked stones. Taking full what? advantage of the round arch the Romans invented, it's made strong by gravity. The Pont du Gard There's no cement or anything in between. No more, it's just museum. gravity. I don't... The Pont du Gard Museum shows that a steady supply of water was an essential part of the Roman art of living. You'll see some very old plumbing. Walk through a rock quarry and learn how they moved those huge blocks into place and constructed those massive arches. Nope, it was aliens. I, I'm, I'm being sarcastic. All this work that. was designed to bring water into the still grand Roman city of Nîmes. Is that another colosseum? gushed out here into this modest looking distribution tank from where it served the thirsty city's needs. Imagine the jubilation on that day in AD 50 when suddenly the system was operational. This is the very end of the aqueduct and water would tumble out of this hole and fill this pool. Now the system was designed to prioritize according to how much water was available. If the water level was high, these holes would send water to the homes of the wealthy, to decorative fountains and to public baths. But if the water level was very low, well, these holes would still send water to the essential neighborhood wells. Genius. Today, the town's many Roman ruins testify to Nîmes' former importance. The Maison. I'm so impressed that I know that the weight is distributed, but still, th this seems like so huge. And is this all solid? It just looks like these uh, an amount of weight that these pillars wouldn't be able to uh, hold, and such beautiful cappings to them. Carré rivals Rome's Pantheon as the most to Nîmes' former importance. The Maison Carré rivals Rome's Pantheon as the most complete building surviving from the Roman Empire. The temple survived, in part, because it's been in constant use for the last thousand years. The lettering across the front is long gone, but the remaining nail holes presented archaeologists with a fun challenge. Match the pattern of the nail holes to the letter it once held. They solved the puzzle. They determined that the temple was built to honor Caius and Lucius, the grandsons of Emperor Augustus. And from that information, they dated the temple to the year 4 AD. Wait, I was going to say, how do you know... How do you know it wasn't like a bigger slab? It does look like they're kind of uniform around letters, actually. Is that like a K? H? What letters did they use? All right, I'm trying to like, actually, no, that's incorrect. Obviously, they're, they're going to be right. And they solved the puzzle. They determined that the temple was built to honor Caius and Lucius, the grandsons of Emperor Augustus. And from that information, they dated the temple to the year 4 AD. Nîmes Arena, which is still in use, is considered the best preserved from ancient Rome. It's another fine example of Roman engineering and Roman propaganda. In the spirit of give the masses bread and circuses, admission was free. The emperor's agenda was to create a populace that was thoroughly Roman, enjoying the same activities and the same entertainment. It's awesome because it actually looks, you know, it's, it's more complete. I, I always was confused with the, whenever looking at pictures or videos of the Roman Colosseum, where it, it, it looked like almost a maze at the bottom, and I was always confused. And then obviously that was underneath the actual stage, and they still have a bit of the where the stage would have been uh, at the Roman Colosseum, but this one looks much more complete. And, and the Roman Colosseum one, Colosseum 
the stands look kind of strange. It just looks more complete here. All thinking as one. To be all alone with your own personal Roman ruin. Take a quick detour. Sorry, I, I keep pausing without... I want to make sure I rewind whenever I pause. The Emperor's agenda was to create a populace that was thoroughly Roman, enjoying the same activities and the same entertainment, all thinking as one. To be all alone with your own personal Roman ruin, take a quick detour to the aqueduct of Barbigal. These are the scant remains Barbigal. of an ancient Roman power station channeling a river to turn their mills. The Romans ingeniously harnessed maximum power from the water flow. They built a series of terraced pools, allowing the water to cascade down, powering eight separate grinding mills. Romans grew wheat on these vast fields and brought the grain here to the mega water mill. Cutting through this bluff, the water from this aqueduct provided power to produce enough flour each day to feed 12,000 hungry Romans. The mill served the nearby Roman town of Arles, and that's where we're heading. By helping Julius Caesar defeat Marseille, the people of Arles earned the imperial nod and their city was made an important river port. With its strategic bridge over the Rhone River, Arles was a key stop on the Roman road from Italy to Spain. After being a trading center for centuries, Arles became a sleepy town of little importance in the 1700s. Allied bombs destroyed much of the city in World War II, but today, Arles thrives again. The most dramatic remnant of Roman Arles is its arena. Imagine the roar of the fans packing this place nearly 2,000 years ago as gladiators battled wild animals. The floor was covered with sand to absorb all the blood. The word arena actually means sand. While the grand city of that. Rome could afford exotic beasts like tigers and lions from faraway places, smaller towns like Arles made do with snarly local beasts like wild boar, bears, and so on. Like in Nîmes, the arena in Arles is still used for concerts, bullfights, and other spectacles. In bears. tumultuous medieval still times, bears locals and... bricked up the arches, turning the stadium yeah, yeah. into a fortified town. Over a hundred humble homes oh, so, sorry, what? spectacles. In tumultuous medieval times, locals bricked up the arches, turning the stadium into a fortified town. Over a hundred humble homes were crammed within its circular defenses. Three 100. of its medieval towers survive. I'd like to see a size comparison with the Roman Colosseum and the that park one. showcases the city's archaeological treasures. Its impressive ancient Roman theaters Amphitheater. make the importance of Lyon as a Gallo-Roman capital clear. You hear the term Gallo-Roman a lot here in France. The Gauls were the original French tribe. 2,000 years ago, the Romans conquered them and they were assimilated into the vast Roman Empire. In many ways, the France we know today grew from that Gallo-Roman civilization. In the first century, the Roman city of Lyon had a population of 50,000 people, which is four times as big as Roman Paris. Hmm. So the city was a critical hub for transportation, and it became the economic, religious, and administrative capital of Roman Gaul. That was cool. I was, I'm, I was almost kind of ready for... I, I forgot at the end that this was a shorter video, usually Rick Steves' videos. Rick Steve's Europe videos are like 25 minutes long. Um, and I, I was kind of ready for that, honestly. And I'm kind of upset it was it just ended. Well, that was so really cool. Um, love y'all. Hope you guys are all doing well. Would appreciate any comments down below answering any of the questions I had, any comments at all, uh, if you've been there or not. Um, if you've been there, I especially want to hear what you have to say. Uh, yeah, so hope you're all doing well. Hopefully I'll see you guys next time. Bye.